Hare Krishna. So, I had a lot of trouble getting this to work. I don't know if it's actually working right now. You're going to have to tell me. It says we're live. I'm uh, a circle spinning around the middle of my screen. I have no idea what that means. But can you hear me? Can you see me? Is this normal or is there something different about this? Can some of you comment and just let me know that we're okay? Because uh, nothing was working properly for about the last five minutes. So I just need, yeah, it's working, okay. So what I wanted to do today was read some things that Prabhupada has written on the topic of self-envy. And then we'll discuss. And the first, first excerpt is from the Sema Bhagavatam, 6, 1642. And the translation is, How can a religious system that produces envy of oneself and of others be beneficial for oneself and for them? What is auspicious about following such a system? What is actually to be gained? By causing pain to one's own self due to self-envy and by causing pain to others, one arouses your anger. This is a prayer to Krishna, so you are capital Y. One arouses your anger and practices your religion. Purport. Any religious system but the process of Bhagavad Dharma service as an eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is a system of envy of one's own self and of others. That's a heavy statement. Any religious system but the process of Bhagavad Dharma. So, uh, we have to ask the question, what does Prabhupada mean by Bhagavad Dharma? Is it only Vedic religion? And then Prabhupada says, service as an eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So if one is purely serving God, without motive, one can be considered, uh, can, be consider, can be considered Bhagavad Dharma. But any religious system that doesn't promote pure service is a system of envy of one's own self and others. So what does Prabhupada mean by that? He means that if you have a religious system that doesn't actually awaken love of God, that doesn't actually liberate you from the material world, then that system is working against your own self-benefit and it's working against the benefit of others. So neither can you help yourself, neither can you help others. In fact, in fact, you are cheating yourself and you're cheating others because you're engaged in something which appears to be a benefit but it appears to give a specific result, but it's not giving that result. So you're cheating yourself. And like sometimes we'll go shopping and, you know, there's a product that costs like $230. And then we go in the store and we see a similar product for 39 So we think, why should I spend 230 I could spend 39 and we get the $39 product and it doesn't actually work as well as the 239 It doesn't look like it's going to last as long. So I just cheated myself by buying, a thinking that I was benefiting myself, I cheated myself by buying a cheaper product which doesn't really do the job. And if it does the job, it's not going to last as long. So it's something like that, that in, in the name of benefiting ourselves, the result is that we'll take birth again in the material world, so therefore we're actually cheating ourselves. And, and if we teach that religious system to anyone else, we're cheating them. So that's, that's in this verse, Prabhupada's definition of self-envy. And generally that's Prabhupada's definition of self-envy. He defines self-envy as anything 
an individual does consciously or unconsciously that works against his self-interest. So obviously, a lot of things people do, they think they're beneficial for themselves, but they're not. And so that would also be described as self-envy because in the name of benefiting yourself, you're harming yourself. So you're not consciously self-envious, but your actions are harmful to you. So in that general sense, you're envious of yourself. That's the, that's the general idea. A general way Prabhupada defines self-envy. But let's read, continue. For example, there are many systems of religion in which animal sacrifices are recommended. And particularly, um, um, sometimes uh, animals are sacrificed to Durga. So this would be an example. There are systems of religion in which animals are sacrificed. Such animal sacrifices are inauspicious both for the performer and for the animal. Although one is sometimes permitted to sacrifice an animal before the goddess Kali and eat it instead of purchasing meat from a slaughterhouse, permission to eat meat after a sacrifice in the presence of the goddess Kali is not the order of the Supreme Personality of God. It is simply a concession for the miserable person who will not give up eating meat. It is meant to restrict his desire for unrestricted meat eating. Such a religious system is condemned. Therefore, Krishna says, Sarva dharmam purityaja mam ekam sharanam raja. Give up all other duties and surrender unto me. That is the last word in religion. So, here Prabhupada is giving an example that uh, some people worship Kali by doing animal sacrifice. So obviously, not beneficial for the animal, generally, although in, in, pre, in the last age, you could do an animal sacrifice and give the animal a new body, but that is not happening in Kali Yuga. And as you probably know, the recommendation for animal sacrifices was to discourage the development of slaughterhouses where people could buy meat which was already killed and the idea being that if they have to kill their meat it will be a deterrent and less people will eat meat and if you're going to eat meat you have to do it in a religious sacrifice so it's it's a bit complicated it's inconvenient so the idea was to discourage meat eating by making people jump through all these hoops but Prophet's point is it's a concession it's not recommended. So it's not good for the person who does it. It's not good for the animal because the person who does it incurs karma. So that's a, excuse me, that's a religious system which is detrimental to the animal and detrimental to the person killing the animal. So if you, do, again, the same point is that if you do something which is harmful to you, then you're envious of yourself. If you do something which is harmful to another living entity, you're envious of them. Now, I know in the way we use the word envy, typically we wouldn't be envious of an animal that we're killing. But the way envy is used in Sanskrit, when you cause pain to another living entity, you, it's considered, you are considered to be envious of them. And that's... That's why sometimes Prabhupada would say meat-eaters are envious of the animals. And we, we would think, I don't think he's envious of the animal. I don't think he has any problems with the animal. I don't think he dislikes the animal. I don't think he wants to be like an animal. I don't think he's jealous of the animal. I just think he wants to eat it. But the way Sanskrit defines the word envy is that if you commit violence to another living entity, you're considered envious of them. So here's an example of a religious principle in which an animal suffers and therefore uh, the person performing that religious ritual is considered envious of the animal. But simultaneously, the mantra that's chanted tells the performer of the sacrifice that this animal will come back and kill you in the next life. So uh, this person is going to suffer also. So he's doing something to cause that will cause his own suffering and that is a definition of self-envy.
So I, I, I know the word self-envy, it sounds very strange because unless you're suicidal, uh, we would think, unless someone's suicidal, we would think nobody is really envious of themselves. Everybody's trying to get ahead, gratify their senses and so forth. But again, Prabhupada's definition of, of being envious of oneself is that you don't do you're not engaged in activities that will benefit you spiritually. And if you want to apply it materially, you can apply it materially also. You're engaged in activities that even materially are harmful. Like eating at McDonald's. You, you could, If we apply this definition, we could say everyone that eats at McDonald's is envious of themselves because eating at McDonald's will, will slowly kill you. Or they will, we'll all die, but we'll die faster if we eat at McDonald's. So, um, so therefore, in that sense, we're envious of ourselves if we eat at McDonald's. Wow, what a concept. And you can apply that to many things. Uh, you know, if you, if you don't finish your rounds, you could say you're envious of yourself because you did something which was harmful. Or, or at least you didn't do something which was beneficial. And, and you could say you're envious of yourself. That's how Prabhupada uses it. So let's read on. One may argue that the sacrifice of animals is recommended in the Vedas. This recommendation, however, is a restriction. Without Vedic restrictions on the purchase of meat, people will purchase meat from the market, which will be over flooded with meat shops, and slaughterhouses will increase. To restrict this, sometimes the Vedas say, that one may eat meat after sacrificing an ins insignificant animal like a goat before the goddess Kali. In any case, a system of religion in which animal sacrifices are recommended is inauspicious for, tho is inauspicious for those who perform the sacrifice and for the animals. Envious persons who perform ostentatious animal sacrifices are condemned in Bhagavad Gita, 16, 17, as follows, Atma Sambhavita Stabdha Dhana Mana Madanvitaha Yajante Nama Yajaste Dambe Na Bidi Purvakam Dambe Na Bidi Purvakam Self-complacent and always impudent, deluded by wealth and false prestige, they sometimes perform sacrifices in name only without following any rules or regulations. Sometimes animal sacrifices are performed very gorgeously with grand arrangements for worshipping the goddess Kali. But such festivals, although performed in the name of Yajna, are not actually Yajna. For Yajna means, excuse me, to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, it is recommended that in this age, specifically, yajna sankirtan paraya sumedasaha, those who have good intelligence satisfy the yajna purusha Vishnu by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. Envious persons, however, are condemned by the Supreme Personality of Godhead as follows. And this is a verse from Bhagavad Gita, 16, chapter 16, verses 18 19. Bewildered by false ego, strength, pride, lust, and anger, the demon becomes envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is situated in his own body and in the bodies of others, and blasphemes against the real religion. Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, are cast by me into the ocean of material existence, into various demoniac species of life. If um, anyone who is against Krishna's supremacy is considered envious of Krishna, and thereby envious of, of himself. These per is a purport. These um, purport continues. These persons are condemned by the Supreme Personality of God. It is indicated by the words Tava Kopaha. A person who commits murder is envious of himself and also the person he has killed. So that for the result of committing murder is that he will be arrested and hanged. 
So, you know, in, in relation to this topic we're talking about, I've mentioned that if you do something which is beneficial for your spiritual life, you can consider that an act of self-love. If you do something which is harmful to your spiritual life, you can consider that an act of self-envy. And so Prabhupada is saying, this man kills an animal, he's envious of himself because he is going to suffer for that action. So if we don't practice Krishna consciousness, we will suffer. And therefore, it's an act of self-envy. If we practice Krishna consciousness, we won't suffer, and therefore it's an act of self-love. So it's, it's nice to place self-envy and self-love also within the context of our own Krishna consciousness, our own practice of Krishna consciousness. If I decide I'm not going to practice Krishna consciousness, then I'm acting out of self-envy, because now I'm doing something that's going to be harmful for me. It's going to be detrimental in some way. Um, if one transgresses the laws of a man-made government, he may escape being killed by the state, but one cannot escape the laws of God. A killer of any animal must be killed in his next life by the same animal. This is the law of nature. So that further explains the concept of being envious. If I kill an animal, that means I'll come back in the next life and the animal as that, as that animal, and the animal will come back as a human and that animal will kill me. So if I do that, then it means I must be envious of myself because I'm setting myself up to be killed in my next life. Right? There's a little circle spinning around and it's hypnotizing me and it's making me tired. I might just fall asleep in the middle of a sentence. So Facebook has been doing very amazing things for the last few months. Totally inconsistent. Every time I turn it on to broadcast, it does something new and different. Today it, it, it listed uh, 20 movies I could watch when I tried to broadcast. So I don't know, it's got a mind of its own. If one follows any other system of religion, he is subject to punishment by the Supreme Personality of Godhead in many different ways. Therefore, if one follows a concocted system of religion, he is envious not only of others, but also of himself. Consequently, his system of religion is useless. Wow. That is a very heavy statement. Now, putting that into a modern context, Prabhupada is saying that it, he, he must be referring not only to Hindu religious movements that kill and sacrifice animals, but he must be referring to any religious system that condones or doesn't condemn the slaughter of animals. And Prabhupada says... So, yeah, these systems of religion are useless. It's a very heavy statement. And therefore, any, any religion which condones, or at least doesn't condemn, the killing of animals, Prabhupada would consider that to be um, detrimental or harmful for the followers and harmful for the teachers, maybe even more harmful for the teachers. That's interesting, isn't it? And it's, um, you know, I was just reading today something very interesting. Um, Prabhupada was in Perth, Australia. Excuse me. Maybe this will keep me awake. So one devotee was in charge of finding people for Prabhupada to meet and Prabhupada could speak to them. And Prabhupada loved to preach. So he was telling this devotee, have you, or asking, have you brought anybody? And he was, he was having difficulty finding people. 
And he said, Prabhupada, I haven't found any people, but I could try to get some priest. And Prabhupada said, I don't want to talk to them, they're dogmatic. I want to talk to philosophers. So, it appears that Prabhupada um, really didn't have a whole lot of respect for so-called religious leaders who were dogmatic and who were also allowing animals to be killed and or eating them themselves. So if we want to put all this together, Prabhupada is saying any religion which condones the killing of animals is a religion which is manifesting self-envy and envy of the people they're preaching to. Because in the name of doing good, they're not ultimately doing them good. That's the idea. That's, that's heavy when you look at the ramifications of it. I mean, you know, the killing of a cow is extremely sinful. And so, although good people may kill cows, they've still killed cows, or they eat meat, they've still eaten meat, and there, there are consequences. And we can't get around those consequences. So basically that's what Prabhupada is addressing. Mm. Mm. Here's another one. Duties, now this is a famous verse, Dharma Sunustita Pun Sam Shastena Katasuya no Parayad Yadiratim Shama Evahi Kevalam. Duties or Dharma executed by men, regardless of occupation, are only so much useless labor if they do not provoke attraction for the message of the Supreme Lord. That's the verse. Following a system of religion that does not awaken one's Krishna consciousness or God consciousness is merely a waste of time and labor. Following a system of religion that does not awaken one's Krishna consciousness. Okay, I, I start a religion and I'm preaching this religion, but it's not actually helping people develop love of God. So what does that qualify as? Um, a waste of time and labor. So now I'm cheating people from their God-given right to develop love of God and I'm cheating myself. Because uh, Prabhupada said that the preachers of false religions, because they're cheating people, unfortunately their followers um, are not, in most cases, going to be doing well in the next life. And their teacher is not going to be doing well either because he's misled them. So, yeah, that's definitely self-envy. Um, you could say, in a sense, at its best, where the leaders and followers all move down the totem pole in the next life because of what's being taught. Next one is from the ninth canto, fourth chapter, text 69. O Brahmana, let me now advise you for your own protection. Please hear from me. By offending Maharaj Ambarish, you have acted with self-envy. Therefore, you should go immediately to him without a moment's delay. One's so-called prowess when employed against the devotee certainly harms him who employs it. Thus, it is the subject, not the object who is harmed. So, I think this is Krishna speaking to Durvasa. So he's explaining that uh, out of anger or, or maybe or out of a sense of your own necessity, you offended Ambarish Maharaj. And when you offend a Vaishnava, everything bad happens. Shastra says, it's like everything good in your life you lose when you offend a Vaishnava. Your duration of life, your intelligence, your wealth, your spirituality. It's one of the... I was just reading yesterday, Bhaktivinoda Thakur said something extremely interesting. 
He said, if you commit a sinful activity, it's not as bad as committing offenses to devotees. And, and he said, because sin, he said, sin only affects the body and mind, but aparad, it, it affects the soul. So it is much, you know, if, if I commit a sin, I can easily purify myself of the sin. It won't, therefore, linger or have much effect. But if I commit aparad, it it takes a while to overcome it. And if I'm committing offenses, then I won't be able to chant well. And if I don't chant well, I'm not going to make much advancement. So, committing offenses to a devotee is an offense to the holy name. And if we make an offense to the holy name, then our chanting is not going to be very good. And it's just we won't be able to chant well because we've offended a devotee and the holy name's offended now. So, the point that's being made here is if I offend a devotee because it's the effects of that offense are so detrimental, then I'm acting out of self-envy. That's what the Lord was telling Amrish Marsh. Excuse me, Dravasa. They're saying, if you harm a devotee, you're going to be harmed. It's that simple. So, you know, I think we all criticize devotees from time to time, and so we, we can think, I'm acting out of self-envy. I'm criticizing a devotee, but I'm actually acting out of self-envy by doing so, because it's harmful for me. And sometimes it's subtly harmful, because no thunderbolts come out of the sky. But it is affecting our, as Bhakti Thakur said, it's affecting us, the soul. Whereas um, sin is affecting the body or mind. So it's, it's way more serious than sinful activity. Here's another verse. This is from Bhagavad Gita. Bewildered by false ego, strength, pride, lust, and anger, the demons become envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is situated in their own bodies and in the bodies of others, and blaspheme against the real religion. Did we read that? I think that was um, referred to in another purport. So we'll read the purport. A demoniac person, being always against God's supremacy, does not like to believe in the scriptures. He is envious of both the scriptures and the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is caused by his so-called prestige and his accumulation of wealth and strength. He does not know that the present life is a preparation for the next life. Not knowing this, he is actually envious of his own self as well as others. Again, that same point is if you're in ignorance, then you can only act in a way that ultimately is going to be detrimental for you. And therefore, that means we're acting against our self-interest, and that indirectly means we're envious of ourselves. As I said before, it's not like we may be even conscious that we're doing anything wrong. But when we do something which is harmful to us, at least harmful spiritually, that's the definition of being envious of yourself. So I made the point before that if we chant bad rounds, if we commit offenses to the holy name or we don't try to avoid the offenses, then it's a kind of self-envy because we could be doing much better and, we, and we're not. We're not making the effort to do better. So our japa may be on the borderline of offenses and if that's the case, it, our spiritual advancement is going to be very slow. And if my spiritual man advancement is slow, and it could be faster, but it isn't because of me, then, then I could say I'm envious of myself. Uh, he commits violence on other bodies and on his own. He does not care for the supreme control of the supreme personality of Godhead. 
because he has no knowledge. Being envious of the scriptures and the supreme personality of God, he puts forward false arguments against the existence of God and denies the scriptural authority. He thinks himself independent and powerful in every action. He thinks that since no one can equal him in strength, power, or wealth, he can act in any way and no one can stop him. If he has an enemy who might check the advancement of this of his sensual activities, he makes plans to cut down, to cut him down by his own power. Sounds like a nice guy, right? Yeah, you probably wouldn't want to be friends with him. Um, there was, I think, an article about demons in uh, BTG and said, it said your next door neighbor could be a demon your postman could be a demon. What is a demon? What does it mean to be a demon? Well, here are some examples. Um, someone who denies scriptural authority. You know. I was... Um, I don't know the context of, of this thought, but maybe half a year ago or so, I was... I was looking at the distribution of Bhagavad Gita like an invitation from Krishna to everyone. So here's my book. In this book it tells you about my home and it tells you how to get there. And it also informs you that I really want you to come and I'm waiting for you. So then I, I put all that together and I said, you know, Bhagavad Gita is like an invitation to go back to Krishna. So then I was thinking, is we offer this invitation to so many people, and they say, no, I'm not interested. So I was thinking, we already you know, fell from grace, we came here, we turned our back on Krishna, we already did it once, and now Krishna, through his devotees, is coming again in the form of Bhagavad Gita, which is an invitation to come back, and we're saying, no, I'm not interested. So we already left Krishna once, we get the invitation and then we say, I'm not interested. Very unfortunate. To say the least, very unfortunate. And so that's an example of being envious of yourself. When um, an opportunity is placed in front of you and you don't, an uh, opportunity to be Krishna conscious and you don't take it, and you do just the opposite, then Consider, we have to consider you're envious of yourself. You're working against yourself. Um, one more verse, and then I'll look at your comments. This is 4.23.28. Any person who engages himself within this material world in performing activities that necessitate great struggle, and who after obtaining a human form of life, which is a chance to attain liberation from miseries, undertakes the difficult tax tasks of fruitive activities must be considered to be cheated and envious of his own self. So, this, this class was called self-envy and I think self-compassion or self-love. So, you know, unfortunately a lot of us are envious of ourselves. We don't, we don't do things. Everything we do isn't beneficial. And uh, especially and those who have low self-esteem, they often work against their own self-interest, maybe to a greater extent than the average person. And um, then they're exhibiting more self-envy in that sense, which compounds the problem. So, ladies and gentlemen, the message is love yourself. And how do you love yourself? You take the Krishna consciousness seriously, and that is the highest form of self-love you could ever manifest. And if nobody loves you, if your mother doesn't, didn't even love you, and love yourself. And, and how do you know you're loving yourself? Because you're taking care of your spiritual life. So let me go back and see if there are some questions. And um, I'm not supposed to be this tired, but I am, and I apologize. I'm like really tired. And I, everyone tells me, take extra rest, take care of yourself. I, that's what I did last night. I specifically went to bed early 
and didn't rise as early as I normally do, thinking that I would catch up on rest that I need. And uh, the result was, I'm still tired now. So you have to excuse me for that. So Suresh is saying he started an NGO and um, he wants to spread Krishna consciousness. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, you'll find spreading Krishna consciousness is a great art. It's not always so easy. People are not always so sensible. Things that make sense don't always make sense to people. And people are very preoccupied with material life. So it requires some expertise to capture their attention. And uh, yes, so does anyone have any questions? I think I will stop here. I've read, I've read all the quotes, and I think I've explained this concept of self envy. Well, so if you'd like to ask some questions, but again. If, for example, you chant, every morning you chant good rounds and you're very steady at it and you finish your rounds before you do anything else, then you're exhibiting a high degree of self-love. And so we can use more self-love because if we love ourselves and we're devotees, then we'll, we'll do more Krishna-conscious things. So self-love is good. Right? Yeah. So, should we end now? And then I can go to sleep and be happy. I'm, you know, in a part of the world which is much later than all of you. So, I mean, I'm happy to take questions, but um, I don't think I need to explain anything else. I think it's been explained well. So, um, painfully <laughs> clear. Yeah. Anyway, the, the, point, the point that I think Prabhupada wants to communicate is to make us aware um, of activities we're doing that are harmful. And so the concept of self-envy is, um, is something important to meditate on. Am I being en envious of myself? Okay, so June and Tony have blessed me to take rest. So I will... Follow their good advice. And uh, Krishna Karshan is blessing me also. Yeah, I was actually, we came back uh, a little bit later from our program, so we started later tonight, and there's a devotee that does massage, and he was massaging me, and we planned to finish in time to take prasadam. But um, he just, he had to keep going. My body is, um, it's just, there's so many places that need massaging. So that went a little longer. Okay, so if any of you are interested, uh, tomorrow we give our class for Australia. And that class starts two hours and 45 minutes earlier than this class. So every time it is, uh, whatever time this class started, well, um, this class started, was supposed to start an hour and 15, not, not, not the time this class started. It was supposed to start an hour and 15 minutes ago, right? So if you go back an hour and 15 minutes and figure out what time it is, and then go back two hours and 45 minutes, that's when class will be tomorrow. I guess that's four hours, right? Isn't it? From now, something like that. Yeah. Okay, I think it is four hours. Yeah, you know, I'm tired, you know. Nothing's working where, yeah, right, right, okay. Um, yeah, okay, I'm so tired. Don't listen to anything I say now. I don't know what I'm saying. Okay, Hare Krishna, we'll see you tomorrow. I'll go to Srila Prabhupada. Go to Premanandi, Hare Hare Mo.